Greetings, friends. My name is Jason Jones. I serve as senior pastor for the Bartley United Methodist Church. Our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known to all people through worship, education, and service in our community and throughout the world. We are blessed to worship with you on this first Sunday of Advent, during which we will celebrate a hanging of the greens, and we pray that you find blessing through this offering. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us join together in worship. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of the King? With the branches of cedar, the tree of royalty. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of the eternal Christ? With the garlands of pine and fir, whose leaves are ever living, ever green. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of our Savior? With wreaths of holly and ivy, telling of his passion, death, and resurrection. How shall we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Son of God? By, By hearing, hearing again, again the words of the prophets who foretold the saving work of God. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Glory, Glory to, to God, God in the highest. Returning the response to the blessing of the Advent tree. Christ came to bring us salvation and has promised to come again. Let us pray that we may always be ready to welcome him. Come, Lord Jesus. That the keeping of Advent may open our hearts to God's love. Come, Lord Jesus. That the light of Christ may penetrate darkness of sin. Come, Lord Jesus. That this tree may constantly remind us to prepare for the coming of Christ. Come, Lord Jesus. That the Christmas season may fill us with peace and joy as we strive to follow the example of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Loving God, God, your, your church, church joyfully awaits the, the coming, coming of its Savior who enlightens our hearts and dispels the darkness of ignorance and sin. Pour forth your blessing upon us as we light the candles of this wreath. May they reflect the splendor of Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. 
for darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, nation, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your dawn. Light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way to salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God will send a righteous king. Reading from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. When I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and build wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. In ancient times, the seal was referred as the tree of royalty. It also signified immortality and what was used for purification. We place this seal of branch as a sign of Christ, who reigns as King forever, and whose coming in justice and righteousness will purify our hearts. <laughs> Even the great ones. 
I feel like it's Jesus' way of telling us that God cares for every itty, bitty piece of this great, big world. God can see and hear even the smallest voices and concerns. And that means no matter of your size, or age, or race, or creed, or even what church you attend, God cares about, knows, and loves just as Horton cared for that clover, God cares for us. And I think today we can all find great hope in that. This week, I pray that you find places to see hope for the future, for a better tomorrow, for eternal salvation. I think that especially in this uncertain time, we can all use a little extra hope. We all pray. Holy and loving God, you created something out of nothing, and you have always cared for every aspect of your creation. You sent your Son to show love, grace, and acceptance to the least and the lonely, giving them all hope. In that example, we are shown the way to live and get closer to you. We give you thanks for hearing the voices of the small, the cries of the needy, and most importantly, for the gift of your eternal hope. We pray that you find ways to guide us, to show that hope to others, to hear the calls of others, and to give the gift of a listening ear. We pray that you will watch over those here today in body or in spirit, renewing their hope and perfecting them in love. We ask all of these things in your Son's most precious name. The prophet declares a child will be born, a reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2, 6, and 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Because of the needles of pine and fir trees appear not to die each season, the ancients saw them as signs of things that last forever. Isaiah tells us that there will be no end to the reign of the Messiah. Therefore, we hang this wreath of evergreens shaped in a circle which itself has no end, to signify the eternal reign of Jesus the Christ.
the fourth servant Saul. A reading from Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him with no account. Surely he has borne our iniquities and carried our diseases. Yet we have counted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us fall, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For Christians, this passage from Isaiah reflects the sufferings of Jesus, who saved us from our sins by his death on the cross and by his resurrection from the dead. In ancient times, holly and ivy were considered signs of Christ's passion. The prickly leaves suggest the crown of thorns, the red berries, the blood of the Savior and the bitter part of the drink offered to Jesus on the cross. As we place the holly and ivy, let us rejoice in the coming of Jesus, our Savior. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, the light of the world, we light the chrismon tree. During this Advent, whenever you see a lighted tree, 
Let it call to mind the one who brings light to our darkness, healing to our brokenness, and peace to all who receive it. Holy Lord, we come with joy to celebrate the birth of your Son, who rescued us from the darkness of sin by making the cross a tree of life and light. May this tree, arrayed in its splendor, remind us of the life-giving cross of Christ, that we may always rejoice in the new life that shines in our hearts. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture for our lesson this morning comes to us from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. And here's what it says. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we have made it through another Thanksgiving. Well, this year was a bit different from Thanksgiving of years past. At least it was for me. Of course, there was still tons of food, more than Christy and I could finish in one sitting. But my most looked forward to aspect of the holiday was well, it was noticeably absent. Because my favorite part of Thanksgiving has always been getting to see loved ones that maybe I've not seen for a while. Catching up with all of the events and, and goings on and, and joys of their lives. There are invariably always lots of laughs, Always lots of stories shared, and a great time is had by all whenever we can come together. But another aspect of my family's Thanksgiving gatherings that's always constant is huddling around the television to watch the host of football games played on Thanksgiving Day. And even in the midst of this year's very strange climate, 
there are many games that are nonetheless taking place. And there's one thing that is a given in those games, regardless of who's playing. And that's the two-minute warning. Now, this warning does seem to have softened a bit in the age of television broadcasts, new penalty violations, endless timeout stalls. Nevertheless, it does still have meaning. The two-minute warning is sounded as a kind of alarm that tells spectators, if your team is way ahead, it's probably okay to start celebrating. This warning tells the coaches, if you're way behind, now is the time to pull out your best play. But it likewise tells the players, if you have begun to fade, or if you have been in a daze, now it's time to get your head back in the game. On this, the first Sunday of Advent, we also get a, well, a two-minute warning of sorts. The word Advent, as I think I remind you annually, comes from the Latin Adventus, meaning coming. But this isn't just a season that the church has used to focus on the incarnation of God in Christ, on God becoming human, and as we heard from John's Gospel, dwelling among us. It's also a time when warnings are ushered through the Scripture, alerts, if you will, that give us a chance to, well, get our heads back in the game. This morning's lesson from St. Mark's Gospel is about the return of Jesus. It's about that second coming of Christ to bring final judgment on humanity and, and to usher in the complete revelation of the kingdom of God. Now, you know as well as I do that much has been made over the end times especially when disasters or especially when pandemics strike. But such announcements of the end of all things, they have been commonplace for centuries, going all the way back virtually to the time of Christ. For instance, Montanus, who lived in the second century of the Common Era, prophesied, that the end times were upon the world even then. And many were swayed by his teachings, and he caused a great deal of confusion in the early church. A host of predictions were made in the 18th and 19th centuries as well, offered by such notable names as Joanna Southcott and William Miller, whose followers later formed the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Jehovah's Witnesses, too, have made several guesses about the end of the world, offering reasons why each one failed to come true prior to offering the next. But what are we to make of these kinds of predictions? The second coming of Christ is a central theme that runs throughout our Christian story. The Old Testament prophets, the, the Gospels, the Epistles, certainly the books of Daniel and Revelation have all pointed to this kind of cataclysmic day when the world as we know it will pass away and, and the perfect and the completed kingdom of God will be brought to bear. Even this morning's prescribed text from Isaiah features these apocalyptic images of, of mountains quaking and, and fire kindling and, and water boiling, all connected to the presence, 
presence of the Lord. My guess is that if you were to visit developing countries, or even some of our very worst inner cities here in the United States, that many people living in those places might say, from all outward appearances of devastation and turmoil, that history as we know it is coming to a close. But as Christ is clear, we are reminded that about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So then what is the purpose of Jesus telling his followers about this last day? He goes on, beware. Keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. And as I read that, I can't help but think that that Jesus' word wasn't designed so much to prompt his followers to fear as it was designed to prompt them to action. You see, the two-minute warning doesn't say that the game is over. It announces that now is the time to really play. What Jesus is trying to prod us to understand here is that the primary duty of the servant is to care for the house in such a way that if the master were to return today or a thousand years from today, the master would be pleased to find the good stewardship of the servants was being lived out. So I guess that raises this question. What does all of this call on you and me to do? Well, if this is true, if this world and our lives are gifts from God entrusted to us, then simply, it matters deeply to God that we believe in God and that we obey God that we proclaim God in word and in deed. It matters how seriously we take the call to follow Jesus, to be blameless in the words of St. Paul, because that is the core of Christ's teaching. It matters how we treat this world of ours, because God calls us to care for the whole of creation, and dear ones, it matters. It matters profoundly how we treat one another. How we live our lives with our families, with our spouses, and with our children, and with our significant others, and with our friends. How we care for our colleagues, and, and how we care for our co-workers, and how we care for our neighbors and our fellow church members. It also matters how we treat strangers. How we treat the hungry. How we treat the lonely. The homeless. The overlooked. And the disenfranchised. See, the two-minute warnings that we find throughout Scripture tell us that these things matter very much to God, which means that we ought to be living our lives in a heavenly way. C.S. Lewis once said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth 
and you will get neither. You see, when we aim only at earth, to say it another way, when all I am is wrapped up in myself, in my world, in my issues, in my preferences, in my concerns, in my needs, then I have entirely lost the meaning of Christ's call. But when we aim at heaven, then life here takes on an entirely different meaning. Because we begin to see ourselves as servants of God, preparing for God's return. We begin to live with an awareness, in an awareness, even a constant awareness, that each moment is an opportunity, a gift to receive, to give, and to live in a way that says, I believe in more than what I see here on earth. I believe that there is something bigger, that there is something better, that there is something grander, that there is something more powerful than any darkness that we human beings can devise. Dear ones, it says, I believe that that someone is Jesus. The one who was and who is and who is to come. And here I, I think I need to be clear. Because I believe that Jesus' teaching on this point has much more to do with how we live than it has to do with when this will happen. I feel fairly certain that the second coming of Christ isn't designed as a way of, of jerking the carpet out from under inconsistent and imperfect Christians. No. In a sense, I believe that Jesus holds this before us, and Jesus teaches us this as a reminder of who we are called to be and how we are called to live in relationship not only with God, but also with one another. But now we need a moment of honesty. Because if humankind, if the Christian family, for that matter, is to be judged on our stewardship of the master's house as it is today, we might be in a heap of trouble. A quick zip through any major newspaper in the United States will tell you that. You will find that we are far from perfect. But you'll also find that there may be much more of a need to tend to God's world and family than there ever has been. But I also don't think that we can let the headlines drive us to despair. We cannot let the headlines drive us to despair. Mother Teresa often reminded her sisters that Christians weren't called to be successful. But they were called to be faithful. The call of Jesus, dear ones, is not to be absolutely flawless. It isn't even to have success as the world may measure. The call of Jesus is instead to be faithful, to live in a heavenly way at all times, whether they be the end times or not. All Christ asks of us is that we would let Him come, that we would let Advent happen in our hearts. 
For in so doing, we are empowered to live with God, to live with our world, and to live with our fellows in a way such that we need not be afraid or worried or even surprised at our master's return. Rather, we can look forward to it with expectant hope. You know, there are several wonderful stories about the great, yet incredibly humble, Ignacy Jan Podruski, the Russian composer pianist who died in 1941. Seems that one evening he was scheduled to perform at a great concert hall. In the audience of black tuxedos and long evening gowns was a mother with her fidgety nine-year-old son. You see, his mother had brought him in hopes that the boy would be encouraged to practice the piano. If he could just hear the great producer. So, against his own wishes, he had come. But as the mother turned to talk with her friends, the boy slipped from her side, and without much notice from the sophisticated audience, he sat down at the piano stool, staring wide-eyed at the black and white keys and putting his small fingers upon them. And then he began to play chopsticks. The roar of the crowd was hushed by hundreds of frowning faces all turned in his direction. And this angered audience began jeering at the boy, booing and, and hissing for him to be taken from the stage. Backstage, Podruski overheard the sounds out front, and he quickly pieced together what was happening. Hurriedly, he grabbed his coat, and, and he rushed out toward the piano. And without one word of announcement, he stooped over the boy, reached around both sides, and began to improvise a counter melody to harmonize to. And as the two of them played together, Podruski whispered in the boy's ear, keep going, keep playing. I'm right here, don't quit. And that, dear ones, that is how I read Jesus' message for us here. And I don't know, maybe to some of you here today, it does appear that we are living at the end of time. Or perhaps your own personal world may be coming apart. Maybe you're at a loss as to how to go on. But if this is your story, Jesus invites you to live heavenly. As the dawn of Advent breaks once again this day, and as we turn our hearts toward the coming of Jesus, may we pause, and may we take a deep breath, and may we aim at heaven. May we commit ourselves anew to the hope that in Christ, life makes sense even in the darkest times. By God's grace, may it be. May this Advent season open our eyes to the wonderful hope for us in the coming of Jesus. For he has come. And his two-minute warning is a reminder to live knowing that he is among us saying, keep going, keep playing. I'm right here, so don't quit. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning is our response to the Word. May we join our voices together in the affirmation of faith as found on page 883 of the United Methodist Hymnal. And let us reaffirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. receive these words of benediction and of blessing. Children of God, go forth in peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Amen.